Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bayside Gallery's very special artist talk to celebrate NAIDOC Week and the Ellen Jose Art Award for Young Women with our joint winner, Marina Benini, who's a young Melbourne-based artist, um, Yorda Yorda Amoraji woman. And I'd like to hand over, well, before I hand over to Marina, I'd just like to acknowledge also that we are on the traditional land of the Bunurong people and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And, and also to um, the emerging leaders and any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So welcome everyone and welcome Marina. Um, could I first ask you just to introduce yourself, please? Of course, thank you, Joanna. Um, hi everybody. My name is Marina Benini. I'm a proud Yorta Yorta Wurundjeri Winya. Winya is the Yorta Yorta word for woman. Um, I am a practicing visual artist living and working here on Wurundjeri country. So I too would like to acknowledge the country in which I am calling to you um, from, this, from this afternoon, being Wurundjeri country. And I'd like to acknowledge um, ancestors and the traditional owners and also acknowledge any um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us this afternoon. Um, so yes, I'm a visual artist living and working here in Melbourne. I am currently got some work at Bayside Gallery as part of the Alan Jose um, Young uh, Women's Award, which I'm very excited to be part of. And I'm also currently undertaking a PhD in visual arts at Monash University. Right, and we'd like to talk today about the work that is in the Ellen Jose Art Award for Young Women. Um, mm -hmm. And very excitingly, you and your fellow artists, Elham Estragic and Harkison, have been nominated as joint winners of the award just on the weekend, which is such a fantastic achievement. So congratulations. And uh, I think it's a testament to the strength of the exhibition and the work generally that the, the judges, Professor Marcia Langton and Max Delaney, just couldn't really <laughs> separate um, yours and Elham's works. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... I would like to know more about mm. Gawinja and particularly there's a lot of archival references in the work, there's a lot of personal references, so um, perhaps you could just start by describing the work and then we can sort of dive a bit deeper into those specific references. Yeah, of course. So to start with, Gawinja is a Yorta Yorta word that translates to after and for me it was a fitting title to encapsulate this narrative that I had created using video. And as you mentioned, Joanna, there are um, three different types of video that are incorporated within Govija. And um, firstly, I um, was able to have access to the ACME um, archival imagery collection, where I was able to digitize some films that were specifically related to Yorta Yorta country and specific sites on Yorta Yorta country, like the Murray River, the Dungala. Um, after having digitized that archival footage, I also went out and researched and looked through other video formats and platforms for more imagery that I was able to pull together. And then thirdly, I went and shot my own imagery um, using my own cameras of um, my family, of myself and um, across Wurundjeri and Yorta Yorta country. And so I've been able to pull um, all these this imagery together to create a narrative. And um, essentially the narrative is addressing centralized systems. And when I say centralized systems, I'm talking about um, Western institutions or the Western um, knowledge system, um, practices that are not indigenous. And through this work, I am addressing and trying to unpack what um, the, that governance um, of indigenous practice and culture um, looks like and what that impact and effect of that governance on our culture, on our bodies, on our materials and practices, um, what it has looked, what it's looked like historically and how that has fed into the present day. And so there are many um, references and motifs that are um, used through imagery. Um, particular references to extraction. So there's um, reference to, uh, you know, extraction from country, and that is shown in um, the usage of that archival footage. For instance, there's imagery 
of um, a scar tree that is being um, taken off and cut down. So taken, uh, cut down and taken off of country. And that is juxtaposed against um, imagery that I took of being on country. So there's a very strong um, comparison and juxtaposition um, of viewpoints and knowledge systems here, Joanna. So my viewpoint being um, from an Indigenous woman, um, having strong ties to my Indigenous heritage and um, critically examining what that Western system and Western um, governance and extraction with our culture, how that has, has historically happened and how that continues to impact us today. Mm. Yeah, it's a very complicated <clears throat> area that you're, that you're tackling. And, and, you know, I sort of see this work really as a visual poem in a way that, um, you know, touches on these things with uh, a firm but but light touch as well because you do bring in the personal really strongly um, and there's some really quite, you know, the, the imagery of the, the scar tree being removed, it's, it's such a brutal, such a brutal footage and you contrast that with your own body in the earth sort of um, coming, coming out of the earth and coming alive and you also... Um, you know, cut back to footage within the collection store of, you know, all of these, you know, hundreds and hundreds of items of cultural significance being boxed and shelved and, you know, so there's this really strong um, and very clear message about the Western approach, which is really about separation and distancing, and then the Indigenous approach, which is about, um, you know, closeness and regeneration and activation and the body too. So mm -hmm. I was really interested in the way that you were using your body so um, in such a symbolic way and so literally. Um, and then when you and I have spoken about the work, you know, you talk about, you know, the, the sort of the, the way the body feels when the body's on country and with, with other people. And so maybe um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about about the body as kind of a, you know, a symbol or a conduit mm. um, perhaps for, for that. Uh, yeah, def imagery. definitely. Yeah. So the body for me is a really important reference um, within my practice and specifically for this work, I really wanted to um, pay homage to the way that my body, I embody the knowledge that is shared with me from my elders and from my community. And I have two very significant people. I call them my knowledge holders that I actually pay homage to in this work, being my mom and my uncle Leon Atkinson. And I talk and reference the body as this, um, the way that I interpret and I'm able to create this deep understanding and relationship to the knowledge that is shared with me is embodying that, you know, embodying that language and, and that relationship. And so the way that I work through um, and learning a through understanding this knowledge is through making. And that's where my body kind of comes in and intersects with this, um, you know, gathering and recovering and understanding of knowledge. So my body, I, I use it to make and recreate. And so we see in the video work, um, my body uncovering cultural material from country, my body being covered in country because I recognize this, the, the connection my body has to country. I have come from country, therefore I will go back to country. You see my body in relationship to my mother. I have come from my mother. And then you see my, my body in rela relationship to physical um, cultural material and item being an emu feather necklace to which I am then given to my mom. And then you, she's seen wearing it. So the body is actually really significant in Aboriginal culture, we have um, traditionally always shared our knowledge and our stories through our body, whether that be through dance or storytelling, visual art, our body is always entwined in that storytelling. And so for me, it was really important and always continues to be um, incorporating my body into the work that I make. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, that makes, you know, again, such a poetic way of sort of conceiving of these really, um, you know, difficult and sort of brutal ideas about, um, you know, the way that cultural material has been treated in the past. And um, <clears throat> you, you said in your artist statement, if you don't mind, I'm going to just read a tiny little excerpt from that, because I'd like you to explain um, you know, more about how you, how you see us going in the, into the future. And you say that the work presents an Indigenous-led future where all centralised governance and power has been dispersed outwards towards Indigenous people and communities. 
So I just wanted to get your perspective on what that, that would sort of look like um, in an ideal world um, and how we would need to make changes in order to achieve that outcome. Mm, it's a big question. Yeah, sorry, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, should- it's fine because that, you know, that's the question that I, I attempt um, to have a go at answering or yeah. an attempt to try to answer through this work. And it's a question that is driving my research that I'm undertaking at the moment. Um, and I think a question like that, um, I start to think about it in, in my relationship to the past, the present and the future. Um, and I think for me, uh, what that looks like is the transformation of the way that Western institutions and the Western, you know, value system in which a lot of our societies are predicated upon. It's a transformation of that system. It's a transformation um, and, uh, you know, push away from how those systems were created. And mm-hmm. it sees us um, turning are back on that system and recognizing that there have been systems that existed before the West and those systems continue to exist and actually um, have an alternative way of um, presenting and thinking about, you know, the things that we as people consider in a completely different way. And when I say that I, I am for myself, I'm talking about the Indigenous knowledge system. That's a system that I am, you know, being brought up in, that I'm still part of and can, will continue to be part of. And, and that's what this work talks about. It compares the Indigenous knowledge system, the way that we as Indigenous people take care of our country, that the way we take care of our cultural material, the way that we take care of our communities, it compares that against the way that um, Western institutions and the West um, relate and consider and understand our culture. And so a dispersal of power is the dispersal of the empire, essentially. It's dispersal of um, the Western Eurocentric value system. And that looks like transformation in my mind. What that transformation could be, I think it could, it starts with little things and big things. Um, And in the video, like, that's what I'm talking about. And there are seeds that I have planted in that video through the comparison of images of what that transformation could look like. A simple simple example being, um, you know, not having our cultural material and items housed away inaccessible to us as community because it's so important that we start repatriating that material that is actually you know not just here in Australia but overseas internationally that we don't have access to so repatriation being you know an example of where to start yeah absolutely and there's a really beautiful imagery of the emu feather necklace that's kind of buried under the earth and and you're you're caring for it, you're almost caressing the earth and then pulling back dirt and leaves and and to kind of reveal it and the footage is in reverse. So that for me was really poignant because it it felt like you were sort of trying to repair or, you know, reverse the damage that has occurred in a very small, personal and meaningful way with just this one object and, you know, returning it to the earth but then still caring for it. yeah, that was, I, I felt that was a really strong sort of poetic um, way to communicate those ideas. Mm. Um, and the other footage that I found really striking was the drone footage of the, the Balm Forest and to see how, you know, this the forest sort of exists as this beautiful organic shape and then all around it are these compartmentalised rectangles, um, you know, that, that are the farmland that surround the forest. Um, and that was just a really chilling, um, obvious example of the different treatment of country and different approach to land. Um, but I know Balm is a very special place for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so it might, might be nice to hear about, you know, what Balma means to you as well. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Balma is um, a really significant place for um, for myself, but also for your Yoda people. Um, Bama is on the, so for yeah people that may not know where Bama is, it's on the banks of the Dongala on the Mai River. So just on that intercept, um, when you go over into New South Wales 
and across from Bama. So Bama's on the Victorian side. And when you go over that bridge, the Kamragunja Aboriginal Mission is actually located there on the left, also on the river. So they kind of sit, um, you know, opposite each other. And I have strong um, family ties to Kamragunja Aboriginal Mission. My nan was the last of um, her family to be born on Kamra and was part of the Kamra walk-off. And um, Kamra is a very significant place for us today. As, you know, Yorta Yorta people, we still have our families and our cousins, um, you know, living there on Kamra. So for me to continuously come back to Bama, it's because of my love for my Yorta Yorta country and the love for my family that are there living at Bama still. But um, I learned so much from my country. Um, country is alive. It's got agency. And I gather and my, my materials and my stories from country. And so that's why I continuously use Bama as a reference within my work, because I acknowledge um, the role that, you know, country plays within my own life. Mm. Yeah. And um, do you, you know, the, the way that you sort of work within your practice, do you find that you have ideas that occur to you, you know, outside of country that really materialise when you go back? Or is it something that you, you try and spend a lot of time on country and, you know, kind of thinking about the work that you want to make? How does that work for you as a sort of a studio? I mean, yeah, do you have a studio practice? Maybe not. It's more of a um, sort of an academic Mm. mindset that you're working from but I'd be interested to kind of know how how things kind of form for you you know in that yeah process mm. I've been thinking about that actually um and for me I form my ideas through yarns you know having yarns with my family and my uncles and my aunties and um, it could be just from one yarn or, I'd be, you know, we'd be yarning about something for a while and then I'll go away and I'll, you know, start remembering what it was we were thinking about. And I was like, and I'd go, oh, that's actually really interesting. Or like, oh, that's actually something that I'd, I'd love to kind of explore through art and, and see it, what comes from that. And so for me, um, the way that I make work and think about work, um, it happens in both ways, on country and off country. Um, but I always, um, through the process of, of finishing a work or getting to that finished point, I'm always traveling up to country um, to continue those yarns, to start new yarns, to gather materials, um, to create work on country and, um, and then vice versa. So I'd be creating down here in the city as well. But there's a strong connection always. Um, and my body is always moving between the two because, um, you know, two very important locations for myself, um, being here in Wurundjeri country as well. So there are significant um, places and, and sites that I visit while on Yorta Yorta country and down here in Wurundjeri country that are very um, influential to me that shape and help me understand things that I'm thinking about. And um, so, yeah, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. Like I really do learn um, from country and, and um, everything that I make and everything I kind of think about always comes back to country. Yeah, yeah. And those, um, yeah, those, that time spent on country must have special sort of flavour of conversations that, that obviously are, you know, different elsewhere. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you today is just, you know, reflecting on your role as a, as an emerging leader, you know, for your community and, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a lot of responsibility in terms of being, a, you know, a young female artist and working within this area. So, um, yeah, I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts on, on, on where you position yourself and, and how you feel about Sort of you know your future role within um as being a, an emerging leader mm. I think for me it's it comes back to why I do the work that I do and it comes from me growing up in community and looking around and just being like so proud of the, my family you know the strength that my family um you know, generations and generations of just strength and passion for our, our culture and for the things that we love. And I just felt so humble and appreciative to, 
to grow in, grow up in such a strong cultured family. And in amidst that, I was also well aware of the hardships that not just my family, but, you know, a lot of Aboriginal community members across all of Australia, all those hardships and barriers and things that we continue to encounter um, through, you know, systemic racism, through existing within this society that has been, um, you know, that is premised on a Eurocentric value system, very different from the way that we as a community live and operate and and work together. I see those hardships and and that's where my work kind of comes from because I, I want to voice our narratives and I wanted to voice um, and work through what where these um, discords or this like, you know, this roughness between our cultures has come from. And for me, I do that through making. And what I make is like what I was saying before, it's an interpretation of knowledge, but it's also a recreation. I love learning how to make traditional Southeastern Indigenous cultural practices, and I love practicing those practices. So, for instance, um, for this video work, I made an emu feather necklace, and traditionally we, as women, would also wear those as skirts during ceremony. And so I, I learned to make these um, traditional materials and objects. And then for me, I love to share that knowledge and, you know, share how to make those objects with my community. And so that's how I see and hope to continue for my practice to evolve and how it continues to connect back to community is that whatever I make and whatever I do, it's always accessible and it's always goes back to my community. There's no um, disconnect or separation because I wouldn't be where I am today and I wouldn't be doing the work I am doing today without my community. So it's always, it's a circular motion. Whatever I make and whatever I learn, I make sure I give that back to my community. Mm, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Um, there's a you're involved with the current show at Mama, I think the Continuous Movement show, which I think you know is trying to enact some of those ideas about really bringing people into the museum and enabling that exchange to happen on on the site rather than kind of happening elsewhere. Um, and I know there's been you know there's a lot of sort of yarning that goes on as part of that show as well which I think says a lot about you know perhaps the, the way that things can can go can move forward and have be much more inclusive in terms of the different ways of practicing different ways of engaging um yeah so I think that's a really interesting model to to have a look at as well um we, we are nearly out of time, but one last question I have, which I hope you don't mind, but I, I found the soundtrack to go into just so haunting. Mm. Um, it's almost a bit sort of sci-fi in a way. It's it's really, um, it's quite otherworldly. And, yeah, so I, I think the work, you know, would have been quite different if it had a, a, a different soundtrack. It's kind of this driving um slightly disjointed you know soundtrack um so yeah did you who did you work with to create that and and sort of how how did you decide on that genre mm. I guess of, of music yeah no that's a great question so um I've worked with William Cooper who's um, musician name is Dimper who's an incredible incredible musician and composer and um I'd worked with Dimper in previously but as a producer and was just so drawn to the way that he um, worked and considered um, composition and sound and you know that one time I had worked with him previously he had worked with a, a grand piano and he had woven gum leaves in between inside and there was this this beautiful transformation of the piano and the sound that came from when the gum leaves would um, hit the piano inside and so for me when I was thinking about this work and the sound that would accompany the imagery for me because the imagery um it it kind of like it changes between fast and intermediate it's got this really it's got a really particular energy towards it and because of the imagery itself um some of the imagery depicted is quite heavy and then some of it is quite light so there's a real different feel as well so there is um I wanted something yeah that kind of was like encasing um and a, you know attributing to um 
practice in indigenous practice so that's where the clap sticks and the fire comes in but then I wanted something to actually talk to and acknowledge you know this this narrative that has been formulated and, and pieced together with all these different videos you know all these different video footages from different archives so I think that's where that haunting melody comes from and that feeling of um, that disconnect and connect and the disconnect and the connect mm -hmm. I think it's it really kind of um, encompasses really what that narrative right, narrative is and and William he got it straight away like I yeah. I just spoke to him about the work and I just you know poured my heart out and told him what I what I envisioned and he sent through um, a track first track and wow. you know, I was like blown away and crying because it was just exactly what I had imagined wow that's so, fantastic. Yeah. yeah yeah really really significant um and I'm very appreciative to have him be part of this work yeah it's um it's truly it is quite transformative that that soundtrack in that it really sort of sucks you in and enables you to look at the at the material um with yeah with a I don't know there's a certain urgency to the music that that you feel um that goes back and forth between the imagery and the and the music it's it's mm. really successful um yeah so <laughs> I took, yeah kudos to, <laughs> to him I really I really loved that part of it um well I think we will just check if we have any questions from anyone which I have to ask my colleagues if we do um to, for anyone to ask Marina but um yeah, if not, I think um, I just want to thank you, Marina, too, for your incredible work. And, you know, the first time I met you, I was just blown away by your intellect and, you know, how sincerely you kind of engage and feel about these issues and, and um, you know, the challenge that you're taking up with all of your academic study, you know, only such a young age. I was, I was so impressed. <laughs> so I really, um, yeah, I'm so grateful to have you in the show and it's been wonderful to have you alongside our other five finalists, mm -hmm. for the, especially for the inaugural um, award, which of course celebrates the life and work of Ellen Jose, who was a real pioneer in the Indigenous art movement um and it's very strong but you know softly powerful woman so it's yeah it's wonderful to sort of bring those threads together for the show and to and to have you and Elham um further sort of celebrated as as inaugural winners mm. um so mm. I might I might draw it to a close and yeah just thank you and thank everyone for joining us today it's a very special opportunity to hear from Marina for NADOC week so Thank you, everyone. And the, I'll add the exhibition um, is on until the 28th of August. So please come and see Marina's absolutely, you know, yeah, astounding work. Um, yeah, to experience it for yourself. Yeah. Thank you. And Thanks, thank, Joanna. Thank thanks you so everybody. much, Marina. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank see you, you later. Bye.